how'd you get out? <laughs> I mean, I'm gonna go there. Here we are in my bedroom. <laughs> So I decided to just kind of tell you guys how I got here. All right, I'm gonna try this thing where I start each video and I don't say, hey guys, I have a jar that has a piece of tape on it that says douche jar. I have to put a dollar in it every time. Dollar in the douche jar. And at the end when there's hopefully $2 in it, I'll donate it somewhere that you pick. I'm gonna take it back to being four years old when it was one of my first memories and I was already a bit of a drama queen. I'm so sorry, mom, but it's who I was. One of my first memories is if I got mad, I would pull my pants down. I realized that that got laughter. And so every time I was in trouble, I would pull down my pants. <laughs> now you can imagine this would be a problem at the grocery store. I think from a young age, I loved the idea of entertaining, making people laugh. It's genuine, it's real. I genuinely love making people laugh. Before dinner, I would want to sing Grace while we all prayed as a family before we ate our meal. We're not even that religious, I just think I wanted to sing. I was in Bye Bye Birdie, I was in West Side Story, I was the fiddler on the roof. I knew that this girl who was in Leduc, Alberta, I wanted to go and do big things and I knew that I couldn't do it in Leduc. Nothing against Leduc. Love LA, Leduc, Alberta, hometown for life, but I knew I needed to get out. <laughs> Once I turned 18, that was the legal age in Alberta, in Canada, that um, you could go to bars, you could drink. So I got a bar job, quickly realized that uh, that was not for me, but I could make good money doing it. I went to some auditions, dancing. Uh, I ended up getting a scholarship from a dance competition that got me to go to Vancouver and dance with a company. I moved out to Vancouver. I remember I didn't have an apartment. I didn't have friends. I didn't have anything except for this hockey bag of clothes and the support from my family. Vancouver, that seemed like a big, big city to me. Big city live in Vancouver, Canada. I lived the life of a dancer. Four, four people in a one bedroom apartment. I would eat. What, you guys don't know in America what Ichiban is, right? I think it's ramen noodles which cut to ramen noodles. I was just living that dance lifestyle where, you know, you're not making a lot of money, you're grinding away as a ballerina. A question I'm always asked is, how did you stay motivated? You're working at a restaurant, you're n clearly not making good money, you haven't gone to college, you don't have this backup plan. What motivated you to keep going? And to that I say, I have no idea. <laughs> just kidding. I just kept telling myself year after year, audition after audition of failing, failing, getting rejected. There's a reason, the next thing will happen. As long as I knew that my heart was in the right place, I just kept going. I ended up auditioning for the CFL Sea Lions, which I'm sure a lot of you have seen the picture of it by now because I post about it all the time, it was hilarious. I look like I had just got my wisdom teeth out, but really I had just eaten one too many bowls of ramen noodles. I was a cheerleader in the CFL, thought I peaked. That was it for me. There's nowhere to go but down from there. I was a CFL cheerleader. Then I met a boy. You guys at home, I said, you guys, does that count for a douche jar or is it only when I start? I don't know. You know, you've got everything in order, planning your life, you know what you want to do, and then you fall in love like a sucker. So being the Canadian I am, I decided to stay on brand and go after a hockey player. He says, okay, well, I'm only here for the summer because I play hockey and I have to leave and go to wherever it was that he was playing at the time. And I said, cool, long distance sounds ideal. Have you guys ever done long distance at home? The worst. We lasted probably two months and we moved in together. So there goes the dance career. Now, maybe this had something to do with the fact that I didn't even realize I was a hopeless romantic, that I would do anything for love. That's what got me on The Bachelor. Maybe it was my path and I didn't even know it yet, but I wasn't the kind of girl who was like, you know what, I'm gonna find someone to take care of me. I was the kind of girl that was like, you know what, if I find love, it's worth fighting for. So that's why I moved. Now, if you've ever been to Newfoundland, put a, like a cup of whiskey in the comments or something, because <laughs> that's what they do there. They like the drink and I am a big fan. And they do it in a way where everybody is just having the best time. It's like a European lifestyle over there. I was really enjoying it until I realized that I was about to be snowed in for several weeks. I didn't have a car. 
he was on the road. I was very lonely. I think I've always been a kind of person that's okay with, you know, I'll pop over here, I'll do this, or I'll take chances, or I'll take risks. But in that moment of not having really anything going on for myself, it was really hard. I was just living somebody else's lifestyle, not knowing where things were gonna go or what I was gonna do. I was losing a little part of myself along the way. And that's when he signed in Germany. Germany. So everything in me told me to follow my heart, you know, follow, love, that's what's worth it in the end. Isn't that what we all want in life? But a small part of me was dying every day that I wasn't doing what I loved to do. And I think that was really hard for me and I think that would be really hard for anyone to lose that part of passion in your life just to follow somebody else's dream. I was still on this journey of figuring out who I was and little did I know this would be a huge part of my story. But in the time I was like, well, I'm going to Germany. <laughs> I knew I wanted to make my own money before going out to Germany. So I moved home to Leduc, Alberta. I worked two jobs. I worked for a roofing company <laughs> and I worked at a restaurant. Now I have zero business being in the roofing industry, but I will tell you what, girl can sell some shingles. Hey, it was passing by, so you need a new roof. Like, I don't know how I did it, but I did. I just knew I didn't want to go through financially relying on somebody else. When you put yourself in a lonely position, he again was gone all the time. One of my favorite things in the world is going to a grocery store and cooking. I would sit on the floor and cry and have a pity party because I could not figure out where to get flour. And let me tell you, if your dream in life is to be a real housewife or live that lifestyle, like all the power to you, high tens, do we do that anymore? Or is it just high fives? I just think you need to have a passion in life while doing that. I don't care if it's waking up in the morning and journaling, that's your passion or writing. Just having a passion, something that brings you joy and makes you feel motivated every day. You need to have that. Going through my 20s, had the craziest life opportunities. I'm, I'm not a name dropper, but so many times I found myself in unique situations that I was like, wow, I'm living the life. And I always had something I was passionate about. The second I moved, and this is nothing against him, the second I moved and was financially, emotionally relying on someone, most importantly, emotionally relying on somebody is when I completely lost who I was. And I don't want that for any of you. I know I've talked about this on my podcast or a few times. I know you've heard the story. Caitlin moved to Germany for a hockey player. She lost herself. She found herself. Yada, yada, yada. Here she is. But when I say I lost myself, that is an understatement. I think I had out of body experiences in Germany where I was a child and I was screaming and kicking on the floor, bawling my eyes out. It was like I was looking down at myself going, why are you behaving this way? This is not who you are. Get up off the floor. And I couldn't. I was just a shell of myself. I mean, we had looked at rings. I thought he was the one. But at that point, he was feeling so much guilt in his life for chasing after what he wanted to do and seeing how miserable it made someone that he really cared about. So I had not only been self-sabotaging, but also sabotaging the relationship at the same time and just making him feel it's so much guilt for putting me in this position that I definitely signed up to be a part of. So needless to say, we had to end things. It just was not going any anywhere good. So we, we ended it and it was very abrupt. I kind of always thought he would fight for me or we would figure it out, but he was like, you are not okay. We cannot do this. And I know deep down in my soul, I knew that. And he actually called my mom and said, we need to figure something out for Caitlin. Like she can't be here anymore. I had to move in with my mom and my stepdad at the age of 27, which at that time, like now I'm like, 27 is so young. You have your whole life ahead of you. But when you're 27, you're like, I'm really moving back in with my parents and the love of my life just broke my heart. And I'm starting from scratch. I have zero job zero momentum, zero motivation. I am in a really rough place and anyone that has felt severe heartbreak knows that you're also going through a grieving process of losing somebody and it is heavy, dark times. So I went to the doctor and I'll never forget filling out paperwork 
on how depressed I was. I remember on a scale of one to 10 being suicidal. I remember filling everything out and just feeling like I had nothing and that life was over for me, that I'd given up all of my hopes and dreams and that the love of my life was now gone. I don't know now looking back if I agree with this, but whatever, he's a doctor. He put me on an antidepressant and Valium. The antidepressant, you know, works through your system and I'm a big believer in medication, uh, you know, always up to your doctor and you, but I believe in it. And so I was open to being on it. Valium, I had never known really what that was or what it would do to me. And it made me numb. I didn't feel anything. I got to sleep. I got to not feel my feelings and that felt great to me. I had become addicted to Valium and I was about 93 pounds and that is when somebody had to shake me and say, you can't live like this, this is not you. And I'll never forget my mom coming into the room middle of the night with YouTube videos of hypnotizing people saying, you're happy, you're gonna be okay. And she would just play it in my ear as I slept. And eventually I just knew I couldn't live like that anymore. I was sick of being numb. I wanted to feel feelings again. I wanted to, to go back to Vancouver and get a job and start over and meet people and get out. So I did. I always think if I could go back to my 27 year old self and talk to her, I would say you can't let anyone be responsible for your own happiness. That is up to you. And now I can say that because I'm in a fulfilling, loving, happy relationship. But 27 year old Caitlin was just starting to learn that and figure that out. You cannot make somebody else responsible for your own happiness. Now, did that take me a few more years to figure out? Yes, because there's more to the story. So it felt like a little bit of deja vu because there I was moving back with a hockey bag back to Vancouver to live in a one bedroom apartment with other people on a couch. I had to apply at a restaurant. A restaurant to me was just short term to get to where I needed with dancing and performing and the career path that I was on. So going back with no other career plans into the restaurant industry, I said, okay, then I'm going to be a GM of a restaurant and that's my new plan. I had to start as a hostess for a couple days at the age of 27 where I had done that when I was 18 years old. I had to move my way up to a dining room and prove myself to get into the lounge, to get into a manager position, which I then got the opportunity to help open restaurants uh, up around Canada for um, still my favorite restaurant, Cactus Club. And I was excited. I was like, I've met new people. I've worked my way up. I can pay my own rent and I'm going to be the GM of a restaurant. That was my new plan. Was I really happy about it deep down? Probably not, but that was my new plan. And then my best friend Brie came in and she said, this is your chance to go on The Bachelor. You want to perform or you want some sort of name for yourself or you want to like make a difference in this world. Maybe The Bachelor is your key to that. And I laughed because I'm like, one, they're never, they're never going to pick a little Canadian to go on The Bachelor. And two, I would probably humiliate myself and I'd be gone so quick. I'm for sure the drunk girl night one, hands down. I just didn't see a long-term plan for that. But you know my uh, my love for love. I was like, but I could <laughs> fall in love with somebody. I could have a platform. I could make a difference and I could also find love. That's when I made a video for Juan Pablo, the worst bachelor in the history of bachelors. <laughs> Sorry, Juan Pablo, not that you're watching this. <laughs> I wish I could pull up that tape. I w tape? How old am I? I wonder if Bree still has the footage from what I said to try and get on Juan Pablo season because they didn't take me. <laughs> they didn't take me until the next season and I wonder why. My fantasy date with Juan Pablo would be to take him to the Christmas markets here in Vancouver, uh, have some fun with him and bring along Camila. And after we put her to bed, we would go for some romantic one-on-one -on -one time. Then we'd have some wine and uh, make some smoothies. <laughs> <laughs> so The Bachelor had called me a year later, voicemail said it's so-and-so from casting from ABC's The Bachelor. We kept you on file. Wondering if you wanted to come on this season, if you're still single. And I was like, everyone thinks that's a prank call. I was like, this is legit. I'm going on. <laughs> Here we go. Okay, so I said, I'll swing by the old Bachelor office. And uh, now if you swing by that Bachelor office, there's a really big photo of me on the wall 
which is just crazy to think about. Before you knew it, I was in a sequence dress at 8.15 in the morning, drinking a mimosa, doing my on-camera interview, and nailed it. And there I went on to Farmer Chris Soul's season of The Bachelor. I quickly said goodbye to being the GM of a restaurant. <laughs> Here goes Caitlin again, giving up her, her drive for love. <laughs> Screw work, you know, I've worked my way up this, this far. I'm gonna chase love again because that worked out really well for me in the first place. We all watched it go down every Monday night. Caitlin dropped an F-bomb out of the limo. I was this crazy Canadian that somehow made it to top three who he probably realized that I was never gonna make it on a farm in Iowa, even though I think I believed I could. Fast forward to me being the bachelorette, chasing love again, finding it, and moving across the country to Nashville for someone I love. But this time with a purpose and a passion and a drive that I was going to be in love, but I was also going to be Caitlin Bristow. You gotta have a sense of humor about things you go through in life because clearly there is a pattern here. <laughs> but it's worked out in my favor <laughs> in my 30s. So the format of the show is to get engaged at the end, and I did. And I moved to Nashville and found myself a great home, a great group of friends, and had so many great opportunities in Nashville. Obviously things did not work out. We all know that. I don't need to get into it, although I'd love to. But I decided to stay in Nashville because I fell in love with this city and the people and there's so many creative minds here and songwriters and entertainers and I just found myself loving life in Nashville. I felt pretty established in who I was career-wise and as a human being. I had learned so much about myself along the way that as crushing as that breakup was, the bounce back was easier for me because of how driven and self-aware and how much work I had put into myself through therapy, through life experiences, through finding my way after a past heartbreak. I think I was just in a position to be like, I'm going to be okay just because I'm me. I think that's why I found Jason maybe quicker than most people would, you know, come out of a relationship and get back into one, but I was happy with myself. I had built things for myself. I was doing the things that I love to do. And meeting Jason was very unexpected. Something clicked in a way where I didn't even understand what it was. I just remember thinking, whoever dates that guy is so lucky. Spoiler alert, it was me. <laughs> I'm lucky enough to have built this brand for myself with, along with a great, incredible team that's helped me along the way. Shout out to Cleo. We've really built something that people trust. That's what I've always wanted, is to build a community and to have people surrounding this empowerment of women, humor, hair accessories, drinking wine, speaking honestly through a podcast form, and now this, it's just, Everything that's led up to this just feels like it's been on the right path because I think when you do things you love, that happens. I often think back, do I have any regrets? I really don't because everything that's happened, every hard time I've gone through, every heartbreak, everything that's happened in my life, there's been a reason for it and I've always come out on the other side stronger and healthier and happier. Somebody on my podcast told me to fall in love with the part of yourself that wants to know why because you care about yourself and that's a beautiful thing. I know we're all at home right now. Some of us are feeling extreme loneliness and it is an awful feeling, but I'm just here to tell you it's temporary. You'll get through it. This is why I wanted to do these videos. This is why I love building a community and having platforms is to be here for you, to be a sense of relief and laughter and just be able to brighten your day in any way I can, especially when you can relate to me and know that I it just didn't fall into my lap. So I want to know how you're feeling. Even if it's happy, I want to know that. If you're scared, if you're lonely, if you're sad, if you're anxious, no matter what you're feeling, let me know. I will try and get back to you. I'm not sure how many people I can get back to, but I'm still going to read all of them and put you in my thoughts. Don't forget to subscribe so we can hang out next week.